All right. Well, welcome back to the next talk. We have Thomas Brazelton talking on equivariant enumerative geometry. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, I want to talk a little bit today about uh, equivariant enumerative geometry. Before I do that, I want to sort of uh, talk about classical enumerative geometry and then uh, maybe what you might call abstract enumerative geometry. So coming at this from uh, a few different standpoints. So the starting out point that I want to uh, talk about is enumerative geometry, in which we're asking geometric questions of the form how many, and we're expecting integers as answers. So this, this dates back to the ancient Greeks. So Apollonius in 200 BC studied this question of if I draw three circles on a piece of paper, how many other circles could I draw which are, are tangent to all three? Um, so if you see over here in black, we've got these three circles that we start out with. These are sort of our initial conditions. And then one of these solutions is drawn in pink. And we're sort of counting how many possible solutions we could have. Uh, another classical example is from Bezu in the uh, 18th century. So if I have planar curves of degree M and N, by which I mean vanishing of uh, homogeneous polynomials in CP2 of degrees M and N, at how many points do they intersect? And the last question I want to talk about is uh, Salmon and Cayley from uh, the mid 1800s, which is how many lines lie on a smooth cubic surface. So when I say cubic surface, I mean we're in CP3. So I've got uh, these four coordinates, and I'm looking at the vanishing locus of the degree three homogeneous thing. So the question of how many lines uh, geometrically we're asking, can you stand at a point on the cubic surface and walk along it in such a way that you're tracing out a straight line through space? Um, algebraically, what we mean is how many equations for lines are still valid when you plug them into the equation for a cubic surface. And over the complex numbers, all of these have well-defined solutions. Uh, so for the circles of Apollonius, there's actually eight circles, which are going to be tangent to all three. Um, this example we know from Bezu's theorem, right, this is there's m times n points if you count them with multiplicity in this intersection. And uh, there are 27 lines on a smooth cubic surface. And here we see uh, one of everyone's favorite cubic surfaces, which is the Klepsch, uh, where you can actually visualize all 27 of these lines. Um, and these solutions are interesting kind of for two reasons. The first one is that they're not boring by which I mean they're not zero and they're not infinity. It's sort of something in between that. There's a finite amount of data that we can latch onto and study. Um, and what's also interesting is that none of these things really depended on initial parameters, right? There's eight circles tangent to any three that you draw on the plane. Uh, for any planar curves, we have this intersection data. And for any smooth cubic, we see 27 lines. So how would you solve uh, such a problem? The first thing we might want to do is consider a moduli space of possible solutions. So if I was going to do lines on a cubic surface, I could take maybe a, a moduli space of lines passing through CP3, which is some complex Grassmannian, and these are lines that either might lie on a cubic or might not. Uh, but it's a topological space that's parametrizing where solutions should live. Uh, the second part, and this is one of the harder parts, is to encode the problem that we care about as a vector bundle over this moduli space. And a specific choice of the problem is uh, some type of section whose zeros are the solutions. So uh, if I have an equation for a cubic surface, it gives me a section of a third symmetric power of a dual tautological bundle on a Grassmannian. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, basically what this is doing is you're taking a line downstairs and you're plugging it into the equation for the cubic surface. And that line's going to get mapped to zero in the fiber if and only if the line actually lies on the cubic surface. So we've taken this whole problem and we've reduced it to counting the zeros of a section of a bundle. And this can be done topologically. So this is a characteristic class computation. Um, so for the, this last theorem, uh, this last example, we use this theorem of Poincaré and Hopf, which says uh, if I have a rank n vector bundle over a compact rank n manifold, together with some orientation data that I won't go into, but that's sort of trivially satisfied over the complex numbers, you can compute its Euler class as a sum of local indices of a generic section. What this local index should look like, at least at maybe like a simple zero, is it something like a Brouwer degree of an intrinsic derivative. So over the complex numbers, this local index is just the multiplicity of the solution. So we're really counting zeros of some section together with multiplicity. Um, so this reduces this thing to like a churn class computation. So I can now compute the Euler class of this bundle over the Grassmannian. It's going to spit out 27. And it has this interpretation that it means there's 27 lines on a smooth cubic counted with multiplicity. And in particular, the Euler class on the left didn't depend on the section, which is saying this 27 lines doesn't depend on the choice of cubic surface. So um, you might call this theorem conservation of number. 
is what Schubert referred to it as. Uh, the story goes that like Poncelet called this the, princi the principle of conservation of continuity, um, there were the principle of continuity in like the 1820s and everyone hated it and everyone was like, that's certainly wrong. And then Schubert came back like 50 years later uh, and did what any clever person would do and just rebranded it and gave it a different name. And then everyone's like, oh, that's definitely true. Um, so this is conservation of number. So um, the cleft that we had earlier, we like it for the reason that all 27 of its lines, which are defined over the complex numbers, their equations actually don't use I in them at all, right? They're all defined over the reals. Uh, but there's other surfaces like the Fermat where the, there's only three lines defined over the reals. So what this means basically is that conservation of number can break over other fields. It no longer remains true, but you can actually repair it using motivic homotopy theory. So there's this theorem that has sort of been floating around for a while. Uh, the most explicit version is in a recent paper of Tom Bachman and Kirsten Wickelgren, but it basically says if I have a rank N bundle over a smooth compact K variety of dimension N, again, together with some orientation data that I won't go into, you can compute an enriched Euler class as a sum of local indices over a generic section. Uh, so now these local indices are not integers anymore. Uh, they become basically symmetric matrices over K or classes in the growth and fit ring of K. So um, the invariance of this local index can encode really interesting geometric information. Again, over the complex numbers, we'd be taking the rank of a matrix and you would recover the multiplicity of a solution. But over other fields, there's more invariance that you need to classify symmetric bilinear forms. And those encode sort of local geometry that wasn't visible over the complex numbers. So uh, as an example, if I have a line on a real cubic surface, this gives you a class in pi one of the frame bundle, which over the complex numbers is not interesting, but over the reals, we have that pi one of SO3 is Z mod two. So any line that you give me on a real cubic um, actually falls into two classes and we call these hyperbolic and elliptic lines. Um, there's a really nice interpretation of this, which is if you're on the line, you can take a tangent plane to a point on your line and you can sort of travel along and see how the tangent plane wiggles. And because everything's projective, you, your plane comes back and either comes back uh, flat like this or it comes back flipped. And those are your hyperbolic and elliptic lines. Um, so there's this result that goes back to Segre in the 1940s. Um, it was sort of pointed out by Finash and Karlamov and Okonek Telemann. And the most recent sort of motivic incarnation of this is due to Cass and Wickelgren, uh, which says that for a smooth real cubic, the number of real hyperbolic lines minus the number of real elliptic lines is three. Uh, and the reason for this computation sort of motivically is that we're getting a matrix with 15 ones and uh, 12 minus ones on the diagonal. So 27 is the rank of that thing and the signature is three. Um, this is a really powerful theorem. It tells you, you know, for example, that you always have at least three lines on a real cubic. Um, but we can actually say more when we look at this in the motivic context, you can talk about this over finite fields where you have a third invariant that you need to classify as symmetric bilinear forms. Um, and I won't say the precise statement of this, but basically over finite fields, there's a further constraint on like the residue fields that your lines are allowed to be defined over. So this is a, a program of math that we've been calling A1 enumerative geometry. And the idea for this is that we're taking tools uh, from motivic homotopy theory to study enumerative problems over fields that are not necessarily the complex numbers. We get answers in growth and equivid of a field, and then we interpret these geometrically. So the tools that we're referring to, um, like I said, this local index is something like a Brouwer degree of uh, an intrinsic derivative. So there's a notion of Brouwer degree due to Morel in this context. And a lot of my work up to this point has been making that sort of more tractable for A1 enumerative geometers. Um, there's also like a great theory of residual intersection that's due to a lot of people that I won't mention. There's a notion of like uh, Schubert calculus and Chow bit groups. Um, so there's like a lot of really cool tools that you can use to do enumerative geometry here. So this idea of conservation of number, it was really a homotopical phenomenon. It said, really, I have a class that's based on the homotopy class of a section and if I homotope that section, that's not um, changing the information that I'm extracting. And we're able to see this motivically because it makes sense to talk about A1 homotopy classes of sections of algebraic bundles. Um, but we might expect to encounter conservation number in any setting where homotopy theory lives. So what I want to talk about today is sort of taking some of these ideas and studying them in an equivariant setting. Um, maybe before I do that, are there any questions on some of this motivic stuff? Okay, if not, I'll keep going. Um, okay, so let's say uh, we're gonna stay over the complex numbers for pretty much the remainder of this talk. And let's say I had a smooth cubic like the Klebsch, which is defined by a symmetric polynomial. 
Um, so what I mean by that is that if I have this S4 action on CP3 by permuting the coordinates, the cubic surface is mapped back to itself under this action. Um, in particular, if I have a line on the cubic surface, when I come and act on it via S4, it gets mapped to other lines on the cubic surface. So a question we could ask is, what are the orbit types of the lines under the action of S4? Um, and this leads us to something that I like to call equivariant enumerative geometry, which is studying enumerative problems in the presence of a group action and getting answers valued in the Burnside ring of the group that's acting on the situation. Um, so the goal here basically is to ask, to answer this question and to state some sort of conservation of number result, which would allow you to approach these types of problems and in particular say, you know, whatever the class is for this, it actually didn't depend on the cubic surface. All that it depends on is this, uh, this sort of ambient symmetry. Um, and maybe let me just say one word about why we care about uh, these types of symmetric objects. Um, what we're looking at here, right, is obviously not the literal klepsch because it's not like a four-dimensional object in six-dimensional space. What we're doing is we're fixing one of the coordinates. We're setting that equal to one, so we're taking an affine chart, and we're just graphing its real points. Um, but the, the symmetry really tells us that all the affine charts look the same. So when we want to visualize objects like this, uh, most of the ones that we like to talk about are symmetric. So this is a very natural type of thing that you might want to look at. Okay, so the, the goal for this is uh, to work uh, with cohomology with compact supports. Uh, we want to sort of understand duality in a parameterized equivariant setting to understand how I can push forward cohomology classes. And then we want to do something analogous to saying like an Euler class decomposes as a sum of indices uh, by saying basically cohomology classes can be decomposed over their support and then pushed forward in, other, in order to understand sort of local contributions. So um, let's fix a finite group G for the rest of this talk. And um, for any G space, I can consider a category of equivariant uh, retractive G spaces. So if you haven't seen retractive spaces, the, the basic idea is that you want to replace how the point behaves in pointed topological spaces with like your favorite space X. So I'm going to just look at spaces that are based at a full copy of X and then I'm also going to assume that maybe there's some equivariance hanging around. Um, so, for example, if I had a vector bundle, I could take a fiberwise Tom space of this bundle. So, uh, over every single point, I've got some vector space, and I can compactify that thing. Um, and I get some sort of fiberwise thing, and this is a retractive X space. It's based at that uh, copy of X living in infinity. Um, and if you took all those points in infinity and glued them back together, you would get the ordinary Tom space. So I can stabilize the category of retractive spaces, and I get something that is called GOS of X. So this is parameterized genuine orthogonal G spectra over X, which is like a lot of adjectives. Uh, the basic idea here is we want to be working over X, we want to be working um, in an equivariant way, and we want to be working in a stable way. So that's sort of the, the properties that we want of this setting. So if I have a map from X to Y, I can pull back, I can push forward along that map, so I can sort of forget along the structure map, and I get this map that's called lower sharp, um, and this would go, go from orthogonal spectra over X, and I can also pull back along F, and that gives me a, a right adjoint to this thing. So I've got this forgetful pullback adjunction. Um, and pullback also admits a right adjoint, as we might expect if you're familiar with some of the six functor stuff, and this thing's called push forward. It's incredibly weirdly behaved. Um, May and Sigurdsson and Poe who sort of indicate that this should, this should feel like extension by zero if we were working in like a Shifi context. Um, but it, it's not really understood in, in a lot of contexts. So, so I want to say sort of what happens in the simplest case when you had a closed G immersion. So I could push forward the, the most basic thing, which is the zero sphere. Uh, but it's a zero sphere over Z, right? So I've got two copies of Z. And I'm sort of wanting to extend that by zero to live inside of X. And what we get when we do this is we get a double mapping cylinder. So I get something like this where I have two copies of X. They're connected by a cylinder, but they're, they're really only glued in the complement of Z. So I'm gluing everything away from Z uh, down to the base. And when you do this, you have this group action happening level-wise, so I can sort of smush everything down. Um, and what I get is something that kind of looks like a fried egg or something like that, where it's hollow in the interior, and I've got this free copy of Z sitting up top like this. Um, and this is something that's talked about, for example, if you're familiar with like Klein Williams work, they, they talk about this a little bit. It's an example in there. Um, but I, I like this space a lot because it's, it's a very good candidate for cohomology with support in Z, because when I map out of this thing, that whole base point has to be sent where it has to be sent, but that free copy of Z can kind of be sent anywhere. Um, so this will come up in a second. 
Okay, so uh, this is a horrible definition, but I, I'm going to write it out and then I'll break it down. Um, if I have any G space, any uh, vector bundle over that thing, any complex vector bundle, or any virtual bundle, or any perfect complex of virtual bundles, uh, if I have any ring spectrum and any closed immersion, then I can define a cohomology of X twisted by this bundle, compactly supported on Z by this thing. Um, okay, so look, we can start with sort of all these different colors. So the A is a ring spectrum. So I can pull it back along the map down to a point, and then I get a ring spectrum living over M. And I want to map into this thing to do cohomology. Uh, when I twist by a complex, what I really want to do is twist by its fiber-wise tom space. So if this is just a vector bundle, that's something that we know how to... Uh, I, I want to take a fiber-wise smash product with this thing, and you can extend this to work for perfect complexes. This is like done... Um, these types of objects were like studied by Siegel back in the 60s. Um, and then the compact support on Z, right, is we want to map out of that thing that looks like a fried egg, so I can like send Z wherever it wants to go. Um, okay, so this looks like a ton of abstract formalism, but it really recovers a lot of the things that we know and love in the equivariant setting. Uh, if I twist it by a trivial bundle, I'm just recovering the Vth A cohomology of my space. So in like the Lewis May, May Steinberger notation, this is what that would be. Um, and I can also push forward cohomology classes, and I can push forward up to a dualizing object if we have a good notion of duality in this setting. Uh, so for example, if I have a characteristic class that's twisted by the tangent bundle and supported on some zero locus, I can forget the support and I can push it forward, and I get an actual element in a ring in, in pi naught of A, and that's something that I can read off. Um, okay, so if I now have a section of a complex vector bundle, I get a map of pairs from the complement of the zero locus to uh, the complement of the zero section upstairs, and I get an induced map on double mapping cylinders, uh, and this gives me a cohomology class that I would call an Euler class. So what this lives in is it lives in the E-twisted cohomology of whatever M is, if M is maybe some manifold, and it's compactly supported on the zero locus. So, uh, for example, if I had an equivariant vector field, its Euler class lives in this sort of thing, in like the cohomotopy twisted by the tangent bundle, and you can push it forward, and what it pushes forward to is exactly what you would expect, which is the equivariant Euler characteristic uh, in your Burnside ring. Um, another example, if I have an equivariant endomorphism of, let's say, maybe a manifold, uh, it induces a map to sort of co-fibering out by the complement of the diagonal, and you do some sort of Tom space magic, and basically you get a class in the uh, twisted by the tangent bundle, you can push that forward, and you would get an equivariant left shuts number. So um, we have all this sort of abstract formalism, but it really is like a natural home uh, for some of the things that we like to study in this setting. So um, the theorem that I would want to call equivariant conservation of number is the following. So if I have a rank n complex equivariant vector, vector bundle over a smooth complex, uh, probably compact also n manifold, an equivariant section and a ring spectrum with orientation data that I won't go into, you have this type of commutative diagram. Um, so let me break down what's happening here. So I've got an Euler class living in the top left, if you can see that. Um, and I can do two things with it, and this will give me the same thing in pi naught of A. So the first thing is that I can just simply forget the support. I can orient, so I'm twisting by the tangent bundle, and I can push that forward. And I get something that you would call an Euler number. Uh, I could also decompose over supports and push forward each of those pieces of the cohomology class over each of the parts of the support. And I would get a sum of local indices. So I'm getting an equality in pi naught of my ring spectrum, which is an Euler number as a sum of local indices. And that thing on the left, there's no sigma in it, right? So whatever number I got, it was independent of the choice of section. And this is the sort of conservation of number result that we're looking for. So um, the next piece that we need that I, I'll call a conjecture, even though I'm like 99% sure it all works, um, which is you could work with a specific ring spectrum that has nice orientation data but also sort of as a nice home on pi naught for this type of info that you would want. So we could take the eilenberg mclean uh, spectrum of the burnside mackey functor, and I can take a local index at an isolated simple point. And what I'm getting is I'm just taking one in the Burnside ring of the isotropy group, and I'm transferring that back up. So I'm getting this coset G mod GP, where GP is the isotropy of your point, um, and that's sort of the local information that's, that's uh, living here. So the big idea here is that um, the local info that we have is encoding multiplicity, but it's also encoding isotropy. So when I'm counting over all of this, I'm really like picking up the isotropy of solutions. 
Okay. Um, so now we have this formalism so that we can approach any enumerative geometry problem basically under any equivariance, um, and we can get well-defined invariants in the Burnside ring that encode the orbits of solutions. So in particular, we can go back to this problem that we started out with when I have a smooth cubic surface, which is symmetric under the action of S4, I can count its 27 lines. And for any such cubic surface, you're going to have the following orbit configuration. So I'm going to have a block of 12 lines that all lie in the same orbit, and they have isotropy group C2. I've got another group of 12 lines, also with isotropy C2. And then finally, my last three lines have isotropy group D8. Um, so this works for any symmetric cubic surface. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll end here and ask if there are any questions. <laughs>